Okay, welcome to Online with the CMC. Well, isn't that special? Um, cataloging archival and special collection materials. Um, go ahead, Erin. All right, um, just to double check, you can hear me, correct? Yes. Okay, good, sorry, I took a drink of water and muted myself. So, all right, great. Good morning, everybody. I'm Erin Rose, the Metadata Cataloger for the Cataloging Maintenance Center, and I'm here today to talk about cataloging archival and special collections. I am going to start by defining archives and special collections really quickly, just because the context of what the CMC catalogs regarding special collections, um, the definition is just a little different. So. Archives are defined by Purdue University as containing one of a kind materials such as diaries, letters and photos that are preserved because these materials have long term value for research. Special collections in the context of this presentation are defined by Purdue University again as a group of items such as rare books or documents that are either irreplaceable or unusually rare and valuable. I just want to also note that I'll be saying archival collections for the most part because my background is in archives and it's just what I'm used to referring to. But I do want to note that a lot of special collections will see the same cataloging treatment that I'm going to go over. So, oh man, sorry. All right, so our agenda for this presentation is as follows. We're going to start by looking at the differences between archives and libraries. We'll move into a brief overview of describing archives, a content standard commonly referred to as DAX. We will look at finding aids. We'll look at Dublin Core and how your finding aids will apply themselves to Dublin Core and how that translates into Mark 21 then we'll do that by reviewing a fantastic crosswalk map. Then we'll briefly peek at EAD and XML, which I won't be going into great detail about, but just want you to be aware of what it looks like so it can be a little less scary. We'll review Mark 21 fields that aren't used as often when cataloging books, but that can be seen more regularly in creating an archival record. We'll look at local notes fields and notes regarding restrictions or other special characteristics of an archival or special collection. And then I'm going to finally wrap it up and give you all some time for questions. So in order to understand the difference between cataloging special and archival materials and other materials, I felt like it would be best to look at what the difference between archival and library repositories is. Libraries collect and provide access to published materials, whereas archives and special collections collect and provide access to unpublished materials. This isn't necessarily static, as archives can and will retain published materials, and sometimes libraries do have archives and special collections within them. Um, but this is a pretty good start. So you might be wondering how cataloging archival and special collections is different from the cataloging that we're accustomed to. And the great news is that it's fundamentally the same concept. In both scenarios, we're cataloging materials to make them findable by researchers. So in all situations, we're looking at what information is important to that process. What will our researchers and patrons be searching for? The differences that we will encounter for the most part are different fields and subfields and different applications or templates or formats for how you code that same information. To describe archival collections, most archivists refer to describing archives content standard known most commonly as DAX, and I'm going to call it DAX because it's much less of a mouthful. DAX is an output neutral set of rules for describing archives, personal papers, and manuscript collections and can be applied to all material types. It also facilitates consistent, appropriate, and self-explanatory description of archival materials and creators of archival materials. DAX is commonly used to describe archival collections of materials. It is based on eight principles. I'm going to go over them really briefly. You're welcome to ask for clarification later if you would like it. And I'm also asked Pam to put a link to DAX into the chat. That link is available in the notes section of my slides too that you'll be able to get off of L2. And you can find the principles and their explanations on the 16th to 20th pages of the um, PDF document. Or if you're looking at the page numbers, they're Roman numerals 15 through 19. I do want to note that most of you attending this session right now won't use DAX when you're cataloging, but I feel like learning the basic foundations can really help think about what to consider when you're cataloging your collections. So let's get into it. Principle one states that records and archives possess unique characteristics. 
Principle two states that the principle of respect they found is the basis of archival arrangement and description. Please don't judge my French or my French pronunciation. It's, it's bad. So respect they found or les respect pour les fonds is a principle in archival theory that proposes to group collections of archival records according to their phone or according to the entity by which they were created or from which they were received. Principle three states that arrangements Arrangement involves the identification of groupings within the material. Arrangement is the process of identifying the logical groupings of materials within the whole collection. And during this process, the archivist or arranger may discover smaller subgroupings within these groupings. So there could be a broader grouping of correspondence that has subgroups sorted by the sender or recipient of the correspondence by dates, so on, however the arranger decides to arrange them. Principle four states that description reflects arrangement. Not only is a collection arranged, but it must be described and similar to grouping and subgrouping, some aspects of a collection are described in greater or lesser detail depending on their importance. Principle five states that the rules of description apply to all archival materials, regardless of form or medium. Principle six states that the principles of archival description apply equally to records created by corporate bodies, individuals or families. This means that you would treat collections from any of those creators or compilers in the same manner when describing them. You can see on the slide, principle seven does have three additional points to it. So initially, principle seven states that archival descriptions may be presented at varying levels of detail to produce a variety of outputs. The extent and complexity of archival materials may require a more detailed description of their various components. 7.1 states that the levels of description correspond to levels of arrangement. 7.2 states that relationships between levels of description must be clearly indicated. 7.3 states that information provided at each level of description must be appropriate to that level. Relationships between levels of description must be clearly indicated. And finally, principle eight states that the creators of archival materials as well as the materials themselves must be described. Provenance is key to the arrangement and description of archival collections. Therefore, the creator or creators of a collection are just as important to the description of the materials. So as you might have noticed, this was a lot of information that I just glossed over. The point of looking at these principles is just to see that both book and other media catalogers and archival catalogers look at very similar aspects when they're describing their materials. So, Archival and special collections are commonly described in finding aids, which tend to be based on the principles of DAX that I just covered. Archival, archival, sorry, sorry. archival repositories such as the Library of Congress routinely create detailed inventories, registers, indexes, and guides to describe their collections of primary source materials. These finding aids provide a comprehensive overview of a collection's scope and contents. They define the con conditions under which a collection may be accessed or copied, com explain its provenance, and contain histories of individuals and organizations connected with the collection. So on this slide, you can see two different displays of finding aids, but they both provide a lot of the same information. On the left, the finding aid is a little more complete. Um, it's kind of what you'd see if you were a researcher searching through the um, ILS, <clears throat> and it's got a URL for citations and more biography and history. The one on the right is one that I had actually created back in graduate school, and it just shows basic information like the title, collection number, extent, and description, followed by a contents list for the collection. A finding aid is really just a document that describes the important aspects of a collection, and that description is typically founded on the principles of DAX. Finding aids are great resources for human readers, but we need to make these finding aids machine readable so that they can be searched and shared electronically. Enter Dublin Core. So Dublin Core is a simple yet effective element set for describing a wide range of networked resources and is a small language for making a particular class of statements about resources. Dublin Core is comprised of two classes of terms, elements or nouns, and qualifiers or adjectives, which can be arranged into a simple pattern of statements. Simple Dublin Core boasts 15 elements, and those are the bolded ones on the right side of the screen. You might notice that a lot of the Dublin Core elements match up to Mark 21 element names. This is because researchers are typically searching based on the same characteristics as those we would highlight when cataloging a book, a CD, a DVD, and so on. When you look at different standards and schemas, you can see that they almost all have the same basis, but just use different terminology and templates or formats. 
give me just one second. I just need to take a quick drink of water. Okay, <clears throat> so the finding it on the left of this slide is one that we looked at two slides ago. It's the same one and the full finding aid won't actually fit on this slide. However, Pam has again kindly provided a link to that finding aid in the chat. So if you want to look at the full one, you are more than welcome to. On the right side of the screen is an XML Dublin Core record. And I just put it together really quickly to show what information goes into a Dublin Core record. And my example follows simple Dublin Core. On the next few slides, I'm going to briefly go over EAD and XML. Also, as I mentioned earlier with DAX, you'll probably not do much work in EAD and XML, but I feel like it's really good to know what's there and how it looks so that you can translate it and understand it for yourself if you run into it in the future. So this beast is a screenshot of a section of an EAD record that has been coded in XML. EAD is Encoded Archival Description, and it's an XML standard for encoding archival finding aids maintained by the Technical Subcommittee for Encoded Archival Standards of the Society of American Archivists partnership with the Library of Congress. XML is extensive, extensible markup language, and it's a markup language that defines a set of rules for encoding documents in a format that is both human readable and machine readable. EAD XML records are machine readable and have the same basic metadata within them, but like I mentioned before, they're essentially coded in a different template or format than Mark 21. Rather than fields, EAD uses what are called tags. And in the next slide, I'm going to show you what those tags look like a little more closely. So in this closer look at a subsection of that same record that was on the last slide, on the very top line, you might see related encoding equals Mark 21. That means that the encoding system from which the fields are specified is Mark 21. Great. You can see that under unit title label equals title encoding analog equals 245 subfield A. Um, that's what would go into a Mark field 245 subfield and or Mark 245 field subfield A falls into that section along with the dates and further specification of the dates. So the total span of the dates and the bulk dates fall into separate sections under what would be subfields F and G respectively. And you can see calendar equals Gregorian. That means they're all defined under the Gregorian calendar. You can also see at the end of unit title and unit date that there are tags with a backslash right after the angle bracket or what I call a sideways carrot. Um, this is simply a tag that closes that statement, or if you want to look at it from a mark point of view, it's the end of that line or field where appropriate punctuation would go if applicable. EAD XML is really just another language for mark in this case, and it's not as scary as it looks, and we all know what to look for. We're catalogers. So here is the same finding aid that I've been using as an example on the left sides of the slides, and it is next to its mark record. While it can seem daunting to connect the information found in the finding aid to the appropriate mark fields, it's not really all that complicated and it's much more focused around notes fields, which I'm going to cover. Mark 21 is richer in data than Dublin Core as it has more fields to address more data. In this Mark 21 to Dublin Core crosswalk chart, you can see that the Mark 21 fields in the first column map to the Dublin Core elements in the second column. And then the third column offers notes if necessary for implementation. For instance, as you may have expected, the 245 and 246 mark fields map to title. And then the third column outlines that you will repeat the title tag for each entry and the 260, which would be 264 if this map had been updated to RDA, would map to the publisher. So remember how that looked in the EAD XML example? It's the same information, just in a different format. So. Here is kind of a bigger look at that finding aid that I've been using as an example. And you can see the headings of the different sections a little better. You'll probably notice a lot of familiar headings that you can already begin to translate into a mark record. And on this slide, I've gone ahead and outlined the mark field names and numbers that would apply to each section. This is a really brief snippet of the finding aid and not all of it is shown, but it, this snippet does show how to apply our language and coding to a finding aid. I'll just give you a quick second to look that over.
Okay, so in the next section of this presentation, I'm going to look at coding an archival manuscript collection in MARC. This slide shows two separate screen caps from the ac same actual record, and all of the data didn't even fit on this slide. Depending on what you're working with, you can end up with a really long record. So now let's go into more detail on the work fields that you'll encounter or you might encounter and how to code them. And I want to start with the fixed fields. Archival and most special collections will be coded as mixed materials since they are in fact a mixture of different materials. The type or type of record is coded as P for mixed materials. BLVL or bibliographic record is coded as C for collection. Um, this is a made up multi part group of items that were not originally published, distributed or produced together. The record describes units defined by common provenance or administrative convenience for which the record is intended as the most comprehensive in the system. Desk or descriptive cataloging form is coded as I for ISBD punctuation and ELVL or encoding level is blank for full level cataloging per the new RDA guidelines. DTST or di type of date or publication status is coded I for inclusive date, which is common for a lot of collections. This collection in the screen cap, <coughs> excuse me, is um, it contains materials ranging between 1948 and 2007. You may also code DTST K as K for a range of dates if the collection does not have concrete dates. Also, when you're entering date ranges, you will enter the earliest collection date in the first um, DTST box, and then the last year of the collection in the second box. SRC or cat SRCE or cataloging source is coded as D for other, and CTRL or type of control is coded A for archival because in this case it's an archival collection. So most of us are used to adding 082s or 092s doing number fields for our call numbers, but a lot of collections have local call numbers that don't necessarily follow Dewey or Library of Congress numbering. That's why we're going to look at the 099 field. This example shows multiple 099s to reflect the different call numbers assigned to different parts of one collection. Audio 1749 is for the audio components that are shelved separately, and the following three call numbers are for different accessions within the collection that could have been processed a little later time, they're shelved separately, or some other reason. According to bibliographic formats and standards, field 099 does not remain in the WorldCat record. It's retained in exported records and records delivered via other services. When you're formatting your 300, or physical description field, you're going to focus closely on the mixed materials designations for your subfields. Since the 300 is a repeatable field, you can enter one for each type of media found within the collection you are cataloging. That's more of a DAX rule. In the example on the left, the collection has text manuscript materials, photographs, a film reel, and audio recordings. There is a separate 300 to identify the extent of each of those types. In the single line example on the right side of the slide, Subfield 3 has listed the materials specified as records. Subfield A is where you enter the number of leaves, pages, items, containers, volumes, or linear feet, which in this case is one, one container. Subfield F is the type of unit, which is here a box. And subfield G is the dimensions, which are two by four by three and a half feet. Field 351 is the organization and arrangement of materials, which is information about the organization and arrangement of a collection of items. Archival collections tend to have more components than a monograph or a series of books and so on, so they're organized and arranged in different ways. It can be really helpful to both researchers and reference employees to know how these materials are arranged so that an entire collection does not necessarily have to be fetched if an entire collection isn't needed by a researcher. I also personally feel like it's important to know what further details beyond the description may show up in a 351. For instance, in this example, I can see that there are radio scripts and if I'm a researcher and that's what I'm interested in studying the most, I know. So notes, um, the beauty and to some catalogers, the horror of cataloging archival and similar special collections is the use of notes fields. There are a lot of them that you can use, particularly notes that will be unique for your institution that may not go into an OCLC or WorldCat record. This can seem daunting, but I personally think that the fields aren't necessarily that complicated. There are just a lot more of them. So I'm gonna start with location. Um, the 270 address 
is addresses and electronic access data, such as telephone, fax, TTY, etc., associated with a bibliographic item. You'll enter multiple addresses, such as mailing addresses or addresses corresponding to different physical locations of an item or facilities in separate 270 fields. The 524 preferred citation of described materials note is a note about the format of for the citation of the described materials that is preferred by the custodian. When multiple citation formats exist for the same item, you can record each in a separate occurrence of field 524. The 851 is physical location, and this field contains detailed information on the location of the holdings. I'm not going to go into too much detail on these because 851 is actually now obsolete. I just wanted to note it because you might run into it in the future. Um, Mark now prefers the use of field 852, which is location. This is the information required to locate an item. You'll use it to identify the institution holding the item or from which institution the item is available. You'll use also for detailed information to locate the item within a collection. In bibliographic records, you'll repeat field 852 when holdings are reported for multiple copies of an item and the location data elements vary. Field 852 does not remain in the WorldCat record. It's retained in exported records and records delivered via other services. I want to note here that throughout the presentation, um, you might notice differences between the screenshots and their spacing before and after subfield codes. For example, on this particular slide, the 270 screenshot has spaces after the subfields, but the 852 screenshot does not. This is just based on how the ILSs that I have used to get my screenshots display them. Um, you don't want to put a space after your subfield code. So 852 is how you do it. The 270 and 524 are not. Erin, no, it's the other way around. There Sorry. should be a space. There should be a space. Yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so the 506 is a restrictions on access note which is a note about the restrictions imposed on access to the described materials. You'll use first indicator zero if there are no restrictions, e.g. the collection is open access, or you'll use first indicator one when restrictions apply. Subfield A is where you include the terms governing access, and the first example shows all of the information for that particular collection within subfield A. In the second example, subfield three describes which materials the restriction field applies to, Subfield B is where you enter the jurisdiction or who has imposed or enforced the terms of restriction. Subfield C is where any physical access provisions are stated, so any arrangements that are required for physical access. A lot of records may be restricted for a certain period of time, so if there is a date that they can be made available for public use, you would enter a subfield G to list that date. Other subfields that you might see in a 506 include subfield D, which is the authorized users or people to whom the restrictions in subfield A do not apply. Subfield E is the authorization or the source of the authority for the restriction. Subfield F is a standardized terminology for access restriction. And subfield Q is where you can enter the supplying agency. Field 540 is the terms governing use and reproduction note, which is a note about terms governing the use of the materials after access has been provided. In the example here, you can see that there is a photocopy restriction on the materials in the collection. The originals may not be photocopied, but the microfilm can be copied. This indicates to me that the original materials are probably too delicate to be photocopied. Subfield A is where actual terms are listed. The 541 is the immediate source of acquisition note, which is aptly described as a note about the immediate source of acquisition. This means that the manner in which the materials came into the repository, for example, the top 541 is for that Vell Phillips record that I've been using as a reference throughout this presentation. A first indicator of zero means that it is private and therefore is not retained in WorldCat, but would be included in exported records and records delivered via other services. A first indicator of one means that this 541 will be retained in WorldCat. This particular record has first indicator one, so therefore it would appear in WorldCat. You can see that when the collection initially arrived, it was given the collection number M2013-134 in subfield E. The source of the acquisition in subfield A is Vell Phillips herself, and there are 115 cubic feet worth of materials. The final processed collection, however, came out to only 36.2 cubic feet, or 86 archives boxes and three flat boxes, 0.4 feet of photographs, which is one archives box, one film reel, and 25 audio recordings. 
you can see that <clears throat> the subfield 8 repeated in each 541 field followed by 1.1. According to Bibliographic Formats and Standards, or BFAS, the linking number is the first data element in the subfield and required if the subfield is used. It is a variable length whole number that occurs in subfield 8 in all fields that are to be linked. Fields with the same linking number are considered linked. This means that if you saw 1.1 and 1.2, those would be linked together. And if you saw 2.1 and 2.2, those would be linked. The linking matches the first number before the decimal point or period. Subfield 3 appears at the beginning of the field in cases where it is intended for display. Otherwise, it appears in other control subfields grouped at the end of the field. In these examples, the first is simply a description of the extent, the second is the type, and the third is the type and extent. Note the much smaller finished collection could be due to a multitude of events that occur during processing. So maybe when they initially accessioned it, the original boxes weren't totally full. There were a lot of duplicates that had to be weeded and so on. So I didn't want y'all to worry about how it went down from 115 cubic feet to a much smaller number. The 544 is the location of other archival materials note, which is a note for the name and address of the custodian of the archival materials related to the described materials by provenance, specifically by having been at a previous time a part of the same collection or record group. Some repositories keep different parts of collections in separate locations, whether it is multiple accessions under one main collection that just cannot be shelved together, different media, so a combination of both paper documents and sound recordings and so on, or that different accessions are held by, say, different divisions of one organization, where it makes sense to have one section in one place and a different section in another place. Subfield A lists the custodian, subfield D shows the title, and subfield E is where the provenance or history of the custody of the collection goes. Regarding indicators, first indicator zero is for the associated materials, which is for other materials identified in the note, have the same provenance, but reside in a different repository. First indicator one indicates related materials which share the sphere of activity, reside in the same repository, but have different provenance. And a blank indicator means, <clears throat> blank first indicator means that no information has been provided regarding the relationship of the other materials to the materials in the record. Field 545 is the biographical or historical data, which is a note with biographical information about an individual or historical information about an institution or event used as the main entry. First indicator zero indicates that the 545 is a biographical sketch. First indicator one indicates that the 545 is an administrative history and leaving the first indicator blank indicates that no information has been provided. When no distinction between levels of detail in a biographical historical note is required, subfield A contains all of the text. When a distinction is appropriate, subfield A will contain a brief statement and subfield B will contain additional information. Field 555 is the cumulative index or finding aids note, which is a note identifying the availability of cumulative indexes and or finding aids whose only or major focus is the described material. First indicator zero generates the display constant finding aids. First indicator eight indicates that no display constant has been generated. If you leave the first indicator blank, it will generate the display constant indexes. Subfield A is the cumulative index or finding aids note. Subfield B is the availability source. Subfield C is the degree of control. Subfield D is bibliographic references. Subfield U is the uniform resource identifier or URI. And subfield three is a material specified in the 555 field. In the top example on this slide, the word register refers to, <coughs> excuse me, refers to a finding aid or contents list. Field 583, the action note, is similar to the 541 field that we went over a few slides ago and is a note about processing and reference actions, such as a brief statement about solicitation to acquire material, whether the solicitation is active or inactive, and the date of the last item of correspondence. Use field 583 also to record information about preservation actions relating to an item, such as review of condition, queuing for preservation, and completion of preservation. First indicator zero is private, so the field is not retained in WorldCat. First indicator one is not private, so it will show up in WorldCat, and a blank first indicator is used when no information is provided. Standard terminology may be used in subfield A, and the authority for the terminology may be indicated in subfield two. You can repeat field 583 to record information about different actions. In this example, again, you can see that subfield eight 
that indicates the linking fields. You can see here that the 583 notes link back to the 541. The 541 is the immediate source of acquisition and is labeled 1.1. Then subsequent actions on this collection are labeled 1.2 and 1.3. Subfield A indicates what happened to the collection. Subfields N and O indicate the extent of the collection. So a lot of collections experience different processing or similar actions. So it's common for them to have 583 notes in their records. The 583 is repeatable for as many actions as you take on the collection. And the example here shows the date that the collection was accessioned and that it was eventually condensed. You can also see that the extent of the collection changed from 23 cubic feet to 9.2 cubic feet, which was a result of processing and weeding. And I know this because if you see subfield KER, this is a collection I worked on once upon a time. So I know. <clears throat> so moving beyond notes fields finally, I want to make mention of the 710 added entry corporate name field. This is, as many of you may know, an access point where one would enter a corporate body that has some relation to the materials being cataloged. With archival and special collections, you will want to include a field for the host institution. When entering a 710 for the host institution, you will code it the same as usual when entering the preferred name from the Library of Congress subject headings if it's there, and you will add a subfield E host institution relator term, as you can see in the example, to indicate what relationship to the institution has to these materials. Field 856 is the electronic location and access field, which contains the information required to locate and access electronic resources, including online resources. Use field 856 in a bibliographic record for a resource when that resource or a subset of it is available electronically. In addition, use field 856 to locate and access a related electronic resource or an electronic version of a non-electronic resource described in the bibliographic record. Subfield A contains the host name, subfield U contains the URL for the electronic resource, and subfield Z is a public note. In the example on this slide, a second indicator of two notes that the URL is for a related resource and subfield Z states that the finding aid is available online, which would be the related resource for this particular collection. All right, now I have thrown a bunch of information at you and we're going to look at the Mark 21 record for that Bell Phillips papers collection that I have been using as an example throughout the presentation. I have updated the original records to make it adhere to RDA standards, but I do want to note that I've only updated a copy of the record in my local save file and not the master record. If you look up the original master record, um, it is still a hybrid AACR2 RDA record that follows DAX principles. I just really wanted to use these slides to show you how a final RDA record would look since that is the standard that, again, most of us adhere to here. So. Looking a little more closely at the record, there are 007s for each of the media types, which for this collection include a film reel, audio recordings, and photographs. In the 264 field for these types of collections, you'll only enter subfield C, which is the date or range of dates. You may also see that there are multiple 300 fields, and as mentioned earlier, there these can all be in a single 300 field per RDA rules. Sorry, I hit the button too many times. All right, so this section of the record shows the 33X and 34X field that would be applied to the record since it is a combination of text documents, photographs, audio recordings, and a film reel. There is also a 351 toward the bottom, which we now know describes the organization and arrangement of the materials. And I'll give you just a couple seconds to look over it since there, there are so many fields here. Okay, and on this slide, you can see the last section of the record and you'll see subject headings. You might notice that the 600 is also Bell Phillips, who is credited in the 100 field as the creator of the collection. This is because a lot of the time with archival materials and some special collections, the creator of the materials is also the subject of the materials. There are also a lot of genre and form terms listed, which can be common with archival and special materials, likely due to the nature of the materials. A lot of archival catalogers use the Getty Art and Architecture Thesaurus, or AAT, as you can see in subfield two, 
when searching for genre form terms, and sometimes they use the thesaurus for graphic materials or TGM, but I don't see TGM nearly as often as I see um, AAT. The example here also has a few Library of Congress genre form terms or LCGFT, along with a handful of the AAT terms. I added the LCGFT terms, the AAT terms were there prior to me touching the record. You might also notice that there are two 710s listed on this section of the record, and that's because the collection is housed in two separate institutions. The Wisconsin Historical Society holds some of the materials, and some other materials are housed at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee Library. Finally, I would like to point out that there is an 856 with the URL in subfield U, which according to the subfield Z, we know links back to the register or finding aid for this collection. I'll just give you a couple more seconds to look at this. Okay, so that's it. I am finally done going on and on about cataloging archival and special collections. This slide here lists some of the resources that I both used to create this presentation and also highly recommend for anybody that wants some more information about cataloging archival materials and special collections. And um, there are also some links for Dublin Core if you are really interested in Dublin Core. So with all of that said, thank you so much for your time and your patience. I know this was a longer presentation. And are there any questions? I am happy to field them. And on the call today, we also have Ian Anderson, Heidi Margold, Sherry Schuler faust Dr. Pamela Thomas to answer questions. Yeah. Sorry, trying to type stuff in the <laughs> chat box it wasn't playing nicely with me. Um, no, just that's totally our, okay. <laughs> just put our upcoming spring um, webinars on there. Um, we're going to take uh, December and January off um, from doing these, and then we'll come back um, February through May. Um, okay, our first question from Kat, uh, she says she's sorry she got here late, but is this recorded and can it be accessed later? Yes. Um, you should have given me board. that question. I could answer that one. Well, um, I won't bore you with the details, but it, it we're not, we don't do it, so it has to come through somebody else who does the editing and puts it on YouTube. Um, but yes, it'll be available um, either later today or early next week. And again, we have the PowerPoint with the notes on L2 um, that you can look at as well. Okay. Um, Heidi <laughs> said, Aaron, can you explain how to create an XML record from a MARC record? Is that common practice? <laughs> Thanks, Heidi. <laughs> Heidi, our friendship is over. Yeah. Um, so, okay. I guess, do you mean like, can I look at a MARC record and create an XML record from it? Is there a um, mapping tool like I know that there is a Dublin Core, oh gosh, and I'm blanking on what it's called because I'm on the spot, but there's a Dublin Core converter mm -hmm. um, site where you can put your data into fields and it'll yes. automatically make the XML record for yes. you. Yes. So is that what you mean? It will do that. And um, if you're in the Library of Congress um, online catalog, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of times you there's a link where you can look and see um, the XML version um, mm -hmm. or mods, mads version of a MARC record as well. Yep. I think I might have actually snagged. I know at least one of my EAD examples phone was from Library of Congress, and I kept okay. having to go back because I kept grabbing my MARC one instead of my XML. <laughs> instead of my EAD. Um, so. And Heidi said yes, so I guess you answered. And then Mary Burns said that Terry Reese MARC edit can also help um with that so that's yes. good to know okay and um i have now allowed anybody who has access to a microphone to unmute themselves if they would like to ask their question feel free um, i don't think yes. we're scary <laughs> and to unmute yourself um there's the mute button is down the bottom left navigation bar so then you just click on that to unmute. 
Heidi, may I unmute to clarify my question? Heidi, you always had that power because you're a co-host, but sure, go ahead. Thank no. you. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, I think my question was more about um, as someone who's more comfortable right now creating MARC records, if I then wanted to you know, transfer that or create an XML record off of something I had created in the past, mm -hmm. how would I go about that? Is it like a tool or is it kind of a manual process? So that's that, I think you answered the question for me. It sounds like there might be a tool out there that I might be able to use. There is, but you could also learn how to code. I mean, you would need to take classes in that I took an entire semester class on how to code but it is right. fun you feel very powerful mm -hmm. when you do it because tags look terrifying but it's like I pointed out it's really just the same data and almost all of the um the terms are the same they're they're the same or they're similar enough where you can derive the proper one so it's just learning the labels and how to yeah. format and structure that Oh my XML gosh. Record. And making That's sure you close part. your tags. I can't tell yes. you how many times I would create something and I would get like a negative feedback on it in the program I was working on. It's because I just forgot to add that closing, closing. tag with a backslash. Yep. yep. Ah. Okay. Hang on. Sorry. Um, Lori says, super clear and helpful. I cannot wait to see the slides. Connie says, thank you. Very informative. Yay. Um, Elizabeth says, OMG, cataloging is already so much like coding. It is. It um, is. So XML is just a different kind of coding. Um, yeah. It's kind of, I mean, it can be challenging, but it can also be, I don't know, kind of oh my gosh restful so, <laughs> like like it, when if you get in the mode of doing it um i i just took a, a brief course um a couple years ago so i've probably forgotten everything but um it was just kind of soothing to me to just like get into that xml mode and and create a record i know that sounds probably odd but so i have like a few nerdy anecdotes i don't know who's seen jurassic park but there's the scene where um Oh my gosh, Samuel L. Jackson's character is looking at all of the lines of code and he's just figuring it out and he's reading it and it's like there are two, about two billion lines of code. And I feel like him when I code in XML, it's like, look at me looking at all this code and understanding it. Right. That's so, the cool part when you can understand what yeah, you're looking at. Yeah. There is nothing more rewarding than <laughs> putting your data into this code and having it come back right. correct like looking at it and being like oh look here's my record <laughs> this is look at the thing I made and it's similar to mark like you can code in OC in connection and as long as you get your fields and your punctuation right and eventually create your record then it shows up in WorldCat and it's like look at this thing I did that other people can see and it's like magic yeah it's okay um sorry Sarah's got a question she said are there differences for cataloging born digital materials versus physical materials um so yes I think um like differences in like the fields you use or how I mean, the cataloging guidelines are going to be the same no matter what format, whether it's right. born digital or uh, mass produced. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be honest, I don't think I have really cataloged anything. I've never done an archival born digital collection. Um, so <laughs> my experience there is very limited, unfortunately. Just to, this is Heidi, just to chime in on that as yep. well. Um, with the born digital materials, there are some additional things to take into account, like mm -hmm. the file size, um, how you're able to open the file, like what programs you might need. So you might have to include that sort of information in the records right. as opposed to what you would include for a physical uh, material record. So how to access, mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Um, and then Elena said, I'm sorry if I missed this earlier. Do you need a specific program for XML or can you just tag within like a Word document? I think we 
you can use, use the a, notepad usually right you can use notepad my personal favorite because i'm that person who likes colors <laughs> is sublime text um i think you can get a paper subscription to it but i was a very poor grad student at one point in time so i used the free version um i know that oxygen exists that's paid there are free xml coding programs that you can get but sublime text and notepad are the ones that i use the most okay and then Sarah said, um, I guess I should rephrase. Are there resources for born digital archival collections? We are looking at doing a COVID-19 local collection and I'm trying to prepare. And Elena said, thank you. You're welcome, Elena. Um, for the resources, I'm sure they exist. There's gotta be something out there because oh, yeah. librarians are all about sharing our code. Um, remind me to go back to that because I have another comment on that but okay I don't know what they are offhand I can look into it and get back with you yep. yeah if um you just give us your contact info or if Pam you have that I've got her name I can hopefully find her in L2 yeah great thank you I am literally writing a note <laughs> to me myself too. now but I'm sorry I don't know that offhand and um, with the code, just a heads up, if you're ever creating an XML record or something, my one of my favorite professors who taught me how to code in XML always said, like, just use something if it already exists and then put your data in. As with exporting a MARC record and replacing information, you do have to make sure you replace or delete fields that you aren't using. So you're just deriving. But, yeah, basically. you're not going to okay. reinvent the wheel. Right. And people share stuff on GitHub. They share stuff everywhere. It's not like there's a super secret. <laughs> well, there might be. But... <laughs> there could be. There and could that, be. <laughs> but I haven't run into it. Don't reinvent the wheel. Find code somewhere else and just repurpose it. And that's also a really good way to get used to looking for what you're going to code. Right. Good point. Okay, are there any other questions? Some really great ones so far, so thank you. That's an area that we usually struggle with because yeah. people are afraid. <laughs> I'm extra excited because there are a lot of them are ones I can actually answer That's to. Right. <laughs> I always hate questions for that. Okay, so just a reminder again, so our next um, online with the CMC is gonna be in February. Um, all the spring ones will be our typical typical third Thursday from 10 to 11 and again they're always recorded. Um, we put the recording on um, IHLS's YouTube page and it's always on the CMC web page as well. Um, and the link is always added to L2 to the event. So um, there are various places where you can find the recordings. We do encourage you to register for the um, webinars, even if you know you can't attend, uh, because I will email everybody and send out the link um, if you're registered on L2. Did I forget anything? Probably. Did, did we want to open it up for any other questions not relating to yeah, this if, presentation? If you have just some general cataloging questions, you can ask those as well. Yeah. It doesn't have to be specific to the presentation. Um, did you want to advance to the your next slide so they can yes. see us looking at our best? <laughs> <laughs> I don't look like that anymore. <laughs> I don't look like mine anymore either. No, no. Sorry guys, I've got lots of gray hair. <laughs> COVID but hair you can time. Pretend it looks like that still and, and we'll we'll be good with that. Yes. Okay. I don't see any other questions. Um, so thanks for attending. And again, um, February is going to be our next one. Um, Connie, who do we now send local authors for Catalog? You send them to the CMC, baby. Um, <laughs> either at, um, Edwardsville or Champaign. So um, ZED or ZCH, use your IDS label, please. And please, if possible, let us know before you send something. Yeah, it's nice just to so get we, an email. Yeah, just so we know 
what's on our desk well, or to and, go and to our desks. Yes, we are still mostly working from home. So if we know something's going to be there, then we'll go and um, run into the office to grab it. So that, that helps to get an email first. Thank you all for attending. And I hope um, you learned at least one new thing today. <laughs> Well, that's and I'm good sorry for my mistake earlier. We that's all okay. nobody likes to present, right? <laughs> yes, so. Connie. Just send an email to um, CMC. Hang on, IllinoisHeartland.org. Yes. Okay. So yes. Um, so yep, we're still cataloging. So we're doing local history, local authors, genealogy, and special collections. Okay, I'm going to stop the recording.